What's on your radar, Brianna? Well, Robbie, just a month after Seymour Hersh reported intelligence from an anonymous source detailing how the United States carried out the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines that were built to deliver natural gas from Russia to Ukraine, the corporate media has finally acknowledged that the report was published at all, but not for the reason you might think. Rather than reporting on Hirsch's journalism, assessing the stated motives for the U.S.'s unlawful attack, corroborating or refuting details in Hirsch's reporting, or conducting their own independent investigations, the mainstream media has recognized Hirsch's reporting only in the context of a new theory of who's responsible for the unlawful attack. Earlier this week, the New York Times published in an article announcing that, quote, newly collected intelligence now suggests that the Nord Stream bomber was not the United States, but a pro-Ukraine group. In the context of this article, Hirsch's reporting is finally acknowledged, not as the detailed source piece of journalism that it was, but in the following aside, quote, last month, the investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch published an article on the newsletter platform Substack, concluding that the United States carried out the operation at the direction of Mr. Biden. In making his case, Mr. Hirsch cited the president's pre-invasion threat to bring an end to Nord Stream 2 and similar statements by other senior U.S. officials. Well, of course, this passage gives the impression that Cy Hirsch based his report on remarks made by U.S. officials. No mention is made of his anonymous source or the details that source provided. Details like the skill level required to execute a deep sea explosion and the limited number of divers on the planet who are even trained to carry out such a mission. Where the drivers, uh, divers were trained, how regular NATO events in the vicinity of the pipeline helped to justify the presence of U.S. ships in the area, how the Biden administration ducked congressional reporting requirements, and the fact that the mission launched from Norway, or even a timeline of when the attack was planned and by whom. And no one could argue that the erasure of those details was strategic. For one, reducing Hirsch's argument to Biden administration statements puts the accusation that the U.S. carried out the attacks in the realm of mere conjecture. But second, detailing Hirsch's account would make the complete and total lack of detail in the new New York Times report that much more striking. As journalist Aaron Maté recently wrote in an article you can find on his Substack, quote, the only confirmed intelligence about the supposed pro-Ukrainian group that carried out the attack is that the U.S. officials have no intelligence at all. The Times report explained that, quote, U.S. officials said there was much they did not know about the perpetrators and their affiliations. The alleged newly collected information does not specify the members of the group or who directed or paid for the operation. But despite the lack of evidence of any kind, the New York Times sources speculated that the saboteurs were most likely Ukrainian or Russian nationals or some combination of the two. Aaron goes on to contrast the credulity with which the Times accepts its anonymous sources account with the skepticism heaped on Hirsch. Despite offering no details and no corroborating information, the Times argued that this story, quote, amounts to the first significant known lead about who was responsible for the attack on the Nord Stream pipelines. While the Times and Times' anonymous sources are considered significant, Hirsch's source was treated with overwhelming skepticism. The Pulitzer Prize winning journalist was attacked as not credible. And those journalists who did opine on Hirsch's report, rather than simply memory hole it, ignore it altogether, relied on ad hominems. The New Yorker claimed Hirsch had gone off the rails and embraced conspiracy theories. And the State Department spokesman, Ned Price, referred to the report as propaganda before mischaracterizing its contents entirely. Take a listen. One of the allegations that Hirsch makes is that it was taken off the CIA in order to prevent involvement, uh, oversight uh, as a covert operation. Did you read the piece? I'm familiar with it. Uh, one of his allegations is that it was taken off the CIA. Look, ra rather than let this, this propaganda get, no, no, be, be aired in, in the briefing room, legal, but let, 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 let me just say it is a fundamental misunderstanding of oversight in our U.S. Congress. Beyond getting his facts entirely wrong, as he has before in very uh, high-profile ways, uh, it is a fundamental misunderstanding to suggest that our intelligence community is not subject to oversight. Anyone who writes that, anything who writes anything like that, no, no, uh, should, no, should not be believed by any no, no, no. that he, he wrote that it was taken off of 
uh, a CIA and put under military in order to prevent... Our military is also subject to rigorous oversight. That, that, that's my uh, question. That's yes. my question. The answer is yes. Do you recognize and abide by the um, uh, war powers clause in such a situation? Just listen to the level of detail that you get about Hirsch's account just from that reporter's question. Of course, Hirsch's reporting could be wrong. His source could be wrong. But the specificity offers ample opportunity for specific pushback. In other words, there are a lot of details in Hirsch's account and in the reporter's question that could be disputed if they were entirely wrong. But instead of listening and engaging to that specificity, Ned Price filibusters, mischaracterizes the reporting, and justifies his non-engagement by calling Hirsch's account propaganda. Now, let's go back to this new claim that a pro-Ukrainian group executed the attack. As Aaron summarizes the Times' opinion, uh, position, quote, U.S. officials have much they did not know about the perpetrators, i.e. everything, enormous gaps in their awareness of how the unknown pro-Ukraine group purportedly carried out a deep-sea bombing, uncertainty over how much weight to put on their intelligence, and even no firm conclusions to offer. And the timing of this report, following Cy Hirsch's inconvenient to the State Department reporting, is also notable. As Aaron puts it, given the absence of evidence and a curious timing, a reasonable conclusion is not that a Ukrainian proxy force was the culprit, but that the U.S. is now using its Ukrainian proxy as a scapegoat. Now, of course, after radio silence following Hirsch's reporting, the corporate media has been quick to pick up the Times' thin speculative account. Reuters, The Guardian, Forbes, NPR, Fox News, and MSNBC all covered the story. The German media has also picked up the report, claiming to have sourced even more details, mainly that a group of six divers and a yacht carried out the attack. There's been little to no interrogation of who trained these divers or how they managed to transport the equipment and explosives needed for the attack to the site of the bombing. The German paper merely explained that the boat was discovered by investigators because traces of explosives were left on the boat, a mistake that seems somewhat out of step with the sophistication of the mission. As Aaron put it, should this lean pro-Ukraine crack team of naval commandos conduct another act of deep sea sabotage, they will only need to hire a cleaning professional to get away with it. The New York Times article does not account for what might be the most damning piece of evidence uh, tying the U.S. to the Nord Stream attack, motive. But despite the Times' eagerness to blame Russia immediately following the attack, even it had to back off that allegation after a European investigation found no evidence of Russian involvement and also no motive. Of course, Russia stood to profit mightily from natural gas sales to Europe. America, on the other hand, has long taken issue with Europe's reliance on Russia for energy. We're all now very familiar with the Biden quote, quote, if Russia invades, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We will bring an end to it. America's motives here are clear. No motive has been articulated for this pro-Ukraine group, however. But the U.S.'s motive in fingering an independent actor rather than a nation for this attack is again obvious. Hirsch's report argued that Norway was complicit in the attack, but a NATO ally conducting an act of sabotage would make it difficult for America to use respect for the rules-based order to justify its imperialism around the world or its involvement in the Ukraine war in the first place. And as discussed, the rap just doesn't stick to Russia because of its investment in the pipeline. But for a third party actor's involvement, the U.S. and its allies would face some pretty serious implications on the global stage. It's a very lucky thing indeed that anonymous sources happen to discover a third party actor at this time, one about whom we know absolutely nothing. The New York Times really showed its hand in its podcast coverage of the story on The Daily, that's its daily morning show. The host, Michael Barbaro, interviewed one of the authors of the New York Times piece, Julian Barnes, who, after giving a cursory nod to the theory that the U.S. had motive and ability to carry out the attack, said this. So, Julian, who exactly was responsible for this attack, and how did you and our colleagues go about figuring that out? Well, I think what happened was for much of the investigation, we weren't asking exactly the right questions. Hmm. And what were the right questions? Well, 
we had logically been focused on countries. Mm -hmm. All those states that we just went through, did Russia do it? Did the Ukraine state do it? And that was just hitting dead end after dead end. We weren't finding officials who were telling us that there was credible evidence pointing at a government. So first he concludes that it was wrong to think governments carried out this attack because he encountered dead ends. But notice what country he leaves out there. Did the United States do it? <laughs> also note what he describes as a dead end, the absence of an official who was telling him that there was credible evidence pointing at a government. So basically, he was relying on a government actor to implicate itself. Absent that, he's saying it couldn't be the government, a government that was involved. Okay, <laughs> now let's keep going. My colleagues, Adam Entis, Adam Goldman, and I started asking a different question. Could this have been done by non-state actors? Hmm. Could this have been done by a group of individuals who were not working for a government? Kind of like freelance saboteurs. So where did you take this new question? Well, we started asking who might these saboteurs be, or if we couldn't answer that, who might they be aligned with, right? Could they be mm -hmm. pro-Russian saboteurs? Could they be other saboteurs? Note again, he avoids the possibility of American involvement. Now, earlier in the podcast, he explained why Russian involvement didn't make any sense. Again, Russia benefits enormously from a functioning pipeline. Destroying it destroyed its leverage over Europe. And moreover, Russia can simply turn off the flow. It had control of its own natural gas, obviously. It didn't need to blow up the pipeline to withhold the resource. That being the case, what is the potential motive for a Russian saboteur? The reporter Barnes doesn't explain, nor does he bother explaining how a non-state actor might manage to pull off the sophisticated operation in the first place. But let's keep going. The more we talk to officials who had access to intelligence, the more we saw this theory gaining traction. Mm -hmm. And my initial thought that this could be pro-Russian saboteurs turned out to be wrong. And we learned that it was most likely a pro-Ukrainian group. So that's the admission that the more they talked to intelligence officials, the more they were pointed toward independent actors, non-nations, actors that didn't implicate the U.S. or its allies in violating the rules-based order. Barnes frames this as finally asking the right questions after asking the wrong ones. Alternatively, this could be framed as ignoring the obvious and asking the questions that are convenient to the intelligence community. Last segment. There's a group of people who did this on behalf of Ukraine. What, what do you learn that makes you think that's what happened? Michael, I should be very clear that we know really very little, right? This group remains mysterious, and it remains mysterious not just to us, but also to the U.S. government officials that we have spoken to. They know that the people involved were either Ukrainian or Russian or a mix. They know that they are not affiliated with the Ukrainian government, but they know they're also anti-Putin and pro-Ukraine. So that feels like an admission that his report is based at least in part, probably large part or exclusively, off of U.S. government officials who, as we've discussed, have an obvious incentive to shift the blame from themselves or from their national allies. And moreover, this report that they've come up with is completely unsubstantiated by the kind of detail Hirsch included in his journalism. The only detail here is the one that really matters from a U.S. perspective, that it definitely wasn't us or our allies, nations, that did it. Really incredible stuff here. Just one last fact of note, Bellingcat, a NATO state-funded website, disputed Hirsch's account by claiming that open source tracking of ships in the Baltic Sea undermined Hirsch's claims that the ships were where he said they were at the times he said they were there. Okay, so this apparent factual refutation was used broadly to discredit Hirsch's account. However, the Times story, it is a little bit useful here, it unwittingly corroborates that ships can turn off location transponders and cloak their movements. This is how the New York Times piece argues the pro-Ukrainian ship was able to access the pipeline undetected. 
Now, Aaron points out that Hirsch has made this point as well, but it was accepted with much less good faith when Hirsch was making this argument than when the New York Times was making this to make the case that an alleged Ukrainian yacht carried out this deep sea attack. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I, I like when he's just kind of speculating, could this have been done <laughs> by freelance saboteurs? No, <laughs> I think is the it's answer. It's like being a child with your hand caught in the cookie jar and your parent comes in and you're like, but hear me out, mom. Right. Might elves have done this? <laughs> you know, you're just, you're just, you're asking the kinds of questions that are leading to the answers that you want very plainly on its face. I don't know, I, I felt like I, listening to that daily episode was somehow more damning than the article uh, yeah. because there wasn't like the, I guess the editor, editor standing between you and a certain kind of admissions yeah. about what's really driving your reporting here. Someone uh, on Twitter that I like, I think maybe it was that Alice from Queens account mm -hmm. was saying like, okay, they're in the bargaining stage. First it was <laughs> denial, now it's bargaining. Like, well, okay, okay, I mean, in Russia, no. But, but saboteurs that they like Ukraine, but they're not US or Ukraine. Um, look, I still think there is, is some legitimate uh, question about whether, about who exactly has done this. Sure, of course. Um, I, I think um, Seymour Hirsch reported a lot of great, it's very interesting. Uh, obviously, we pressed him when we interviewed him for more details about his sources, which he understandably can't provide. Um, I, I have also seen, you know, some reporting on whether Ukraine, not, not a Stab, not an independent saboteur group that happens to have Ukraine's best interest in mind, but the country Ukraine, right. directed by its government, right. are the responsible party. I find that, again, I don't know anything more than anyone else, I find that to be probably, the, in my own view, the leading and likely um, uh, actor involved. But that's but, important, right? And they, they get into this in the, in the but podcast not, no, episode. But not just random people who like Ukraine. Right, but the, it's important. Random Russian people it's who a, like Ukraine, right? right? <laughs> it's a, it, that, that's what's so interesting here. It's so important for no nations to be implicated. Because if it's Ukraine, it's with one, it's, it, it implicates an ally. Mm -hmm. And two, it's probably with the support, investment, or at least you know approval of the mm -hmm. American government as well. Or some and, aspect of the American government. Right, right, exactly. And if Ukraine is now in a position of being fingered as having destroyed the property of a NATO country, right. someone who we are actually in treat, at a treaty relationship with, the implications of us continuing to side with Ukraine and fight with Ukraine is a disaster from a foreign policy perspective. Yeah. So you mentioned Alice McQueen. She's a favorite of, of mine in terms yeah. of Twitter accounts. She tweeted the other day, uh, new theory, the Nord Stream leak came from the wet market. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Perfect. Perfect. Right. Chef kissy react right. thing. Perfect. All right. All right. Great radar, Brianna. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. More rising right after this.